Okay. Uh, I don't know why that is happening. Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual tour of the Transcona Cemetery presented to you today uh, by the Transcona Museum. Uh, before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that we reside on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining our talk today. We would also like to take this opportunity um, to ask you to support the museum and you're supporting it right now by watching our video, but uh, we're asking that you please consider making a donation or becoming a museum member and that can be done on our website. Uh, you can stay in touch, check out our website and see what we're doing. Uh, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, blog. Uh, you could join our mailing list and uh, you'll get our e-newsletter and we only send out one to two things a month so we won't be spamming you or anything like that. But all of these are ways that you can support the museum. So uh, we're going to get started with what essentially is like the history of the cemetery. And actually before you do, Jennifer, can you tell me what's the difference between a cemetery and a graveyard? One of them is consecrated by a church and one of them is not. Yes, so a graveyard is connected to a church and a cemetery is a standalone place. So for the history of the site, the land was originally owned by Peter K. Dixon, uh, who was actually the former postmaster of Sethwin. And the land where the cemetery currently is used to actually be within the boundaries of a community called Sethwin. Um, Technically, it's not even in Winnipeg today. It's in Springfield. Um, so that's who originally Peter, Dick, Peter K. Dixon uh, owned the land. In 1900, he donated a one acre section of his property for the future site of the Sethwin Presbyterian Church. Uh, we don't have any images of this church, but we do have this drawing from the uh, Springfield First Rural Municipality in Manitoba book. Uh, so that's the only image we have of the church. Um, the church was later sold to the town of Transcona. Um, and it was after uh, the congregation depleted and it was no longer being used. Uh, it was sold to the town. By 1907, uh, Dixon had sold the remaining property, uh, his remaining property to a real estate firm. And the proposed develop subdivision was called Dixon Estate, uh, which was actually never developed. Um, so the church that was built on this site um, that would become the cemetery, um, it was described this church as being a very stately building of solid brick with a 60 foot tower over the front entrance. It was officially opened in December of 1900 and membership would unfortunately dwindle by 1912 and services were discontinued by 1916. The church, as mentioned, was later sold to the town of Transcona for $600, but would stand empty until 1932. So um, to establish the cemetery, and this is the plan of this right here, is where the cemetery is. And is. Then that's the church. This right here would be where the church um, was. So in March of 1914, a special meeting of town council was held uh, in private to decide on the site for the Transcoma Cemetery, and this was the uh, site that was chosen. The Transcona Real Estate Association purchased 39 acres of land for $655 per acre, uh, which came to a total of $25,545. Four months later in July of 1914, the Transcona Cemetery was opened. Uh, several propositions were made with the actual site being this site was the most favored of all the sites that were offered up as being the cemetery. And in the Transcona Times newspaper, it stated the property is nicely located and a grove runs through the center. Which is still more or less 
the same. Yes. There's a grove running through the center of the cemetery. And there was a cash payment of 15% of the total. So that was approximately $3,832 that was made to the owners up front to purchase this land for the cemetery. Um, so now the mortuary. Um, so in 1932, it was decided that the Southland Presbyterian Church would be dismantled. So remember, it had been standing empty for quite a number of years at this point. A considerable portion of the church's bricks were used by Arthur William Gerling to construct the mortuary at the cemetery. And according to the Transcona Times newspaper, the mortuary was met with approval by the community as it provided the necessary facilities for deferred burial during the winter months. Now, supposedly, some of the bricks from the former Transcona incinerator were used in the construction of the mortuary as well. And that's the picture of the incinerator up at the top, with mortuary being the other photograph. The mortuary itself is built of solid brick on a 13-inch concrete foundation with turret effect around the top of the walls. The chapel portion was decorated on the interior in shades of brown. A set of three Gothic windows matched the main doors and helped to create an atmosphere desired for a building of this nature. The basement was divided into two parts by a solid wall. The rear section comprised a vault where uh, accommodation for 40 caskets was provided. The front portion was, uh, of the basement was intended for a store or workroom. Which unfortunately we don't have any photographs of the interior of the mortuary. Uh, that would be really interesting to actually see. Um, what it actually looks like inside. I've never seen the inside of it. So now we're going to take you through a virtual walkthrough of the Transcona Cemetery. And we would like to thank um, Bill Blakey as he helped provide us with information during uh, for this talk. Initially, we were planning this to actually be a physical walking tour through the Transcona Cemetery. Unfortunately, due to um, legal, legal essentially. Uh, the city said we could do a tour through the cemetery. However, it would have to be a driving tour and it didn't really work for what we were planning on doing. So we've decided to create this virtual walkthrough. And just please note, um, if you have any suggestions of individuals to include in this tour, uh, please use the chat function or direct message us uh, with names. Uh, the names that we have chosen are, or the burials that we've chosen are based on uh, ones of interest, individuals who played a significant role in the history of Transcona, maybe have an interesting background or story. Um, so those individuals or burials are who we focus on um, at this time. But like we said, um, if you have anyone that you feel that we should include, please let us know. Yes because there are many more individuals buried in the cemetery than what we're able to present to you today. <laughs> so we're going to start with the oldest sections of the cemetery, and those are sections 1, 7, 8, and 12. Now section 7 was the original location for infant and child burials, um, and most of them are now in either section 4 and some are in section 2. Um, some of the early headstones are no longer present or have since been relocated to other sections of the cemetery. And a total of about 22 individuals were buried in that first year in 1914. So the oldest section of the cemetery, um, a number of the graves uh, use curb sets to frame the grave sites. So if you can see uh, my mouse, you can see the stone or concrete frame going around um, like a family. Usually these are family, family plots. Uh, materials were used were based on accessibility, affordability, and popularity. Um, and that includes sculpture design, artwork, images, and symbols. Uh, these uh, gravestones and grave markers have more visible deterioration than others in the cemetery, but again, likely due to the fact that these are some of the earliest graves um, in the cemetery. So you can see some of the examples that we've put on here where the ground has essentially sunk around the headstone. Here, this is sort of a moss or uh, leachin. leachin that has, is growing on the gravestone. Um, 
Uh, so to start off, we're going to, uh, is a Soren Sorensen, uh, section one. Uh, he was born around 1866 and died in 1914. And he is the first individual interned at the cemetery on July 18th of 1914. Now, there is no grave marker. Um, if there was, it's no longer present. And his, along with Sam Serafin and Andrew Stephen, they are the first burials in the cemetery, but they do not have any grave markers. So this is where they would be in, um, in the cemetery. Uh, so this is the very back kind of corner section. So Soren Sorensen is approximately here, then Sam Serafin, and then Andrew Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Oh, Stephen. The first gravestone, or the oldest gravestone uh, head grave marker that we have is Annie McKellen's, uh, born approximately 1866 and died in 1914. Um, and we definitely want to do some more research on her uh, to see if we can better understand her story and what it is. But hers is the oldest surviving uh, grave marker in the cemetery. Uh, correction, she was born in 1886. Oh. <laughs> uh, so this is Roger Garth. He does not have a grave marker, um, but some of most of the earliest um, markers in the cemetery had these number markers, um, so which are basically like the plots within the cemetery. So uh, one of our board members, uh, Rick Walker, uh, went and found his. Uh, so this is where um, Roger Garth is buried in section one. Um, he was born around 1862 and died in 1922. And he was a caretaker um, at the Springfield School in South Transcona. Uh, he was born in uh, Lancastershire, England, um, like I said, around 1862. Um, he married Margaret Ellen Wilson in November of 1885, and she would later pass away in uh, 1928. But he came to Canada in 1905 to make enough money to support his wife, who was in a nursing home back in England. Uh, the couple did have several children, uh, but none would survive to adulthood. Um, he was noted as being a musician who played the organ and piano. Um, as a caretaker at the school in South Transcona, he taught children how to tend the gardens at the school. He was also noted as being a very kind um, and considerate gentleman. Uh, the next individual is Annie Simpson, uh, born 1921, died 1924. Uh, and she died during a diphtheria outbreak. Um, the Simpson family immigrated to Transcona in 1912, and um, her father, Samuel Simpson, worked at the Transcona shops as a boilerman and served in World War I, and we have his World War I uh, uniform kilt here at the museum in our collection. Uh, so we're going to move to the field of honor. Um, so following the First World War, the town of Transcona established a military section of the cemetery as a symbol of the respect and remembrance in honor of those men who served with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. There are approximately 325 graves in the field of honor at this time. And there is one notable, um, particularly notable individual in the field of honor, and that is Private Harold Marlin Andrews. He was born in 1889 and died in 1923. He immigrated to Canada, uh, to Transcona, and worked as a trade clerk. Uh, he would enlist in the First World War and serve with the 79th Cameron Highlanders. Uh, he would survive the war, but would later die in September of 1923. And he is the only individual commemorated on the Transcona Cenotaph who is buried in the cemetery. And his son would actually serve in World War II, but would be killed in action as a RCAF pilot. Yeah, and we think we may know why he's both buried here and on the cenotaph. Uh, during the early 1920s, uh, the community of Transcona, the town of Transcona, actually went bankrupt, and it was being uh, administered by the province. So after the First World War ended, the Cenotaph wasn't actually finished and created until 1931, 1932. 
So there was a, a long time period of after the war to when the sun attack was actually completed. So what we're thinking is that he likely died of his wounds that he that he was inflicted with during World War One, and so while he passed away here in Canada, it was due to the war. This is all conjecture and thoughts on our process. Mm -hmm. But so then he was added to the cenotaph for remembrance because of his of his service. That's what we can guess because we there were names that were missing off of the World War One cenotaph after it had initially been done. And I think that's due to the time lapse between. So people, families may have moved away. Uh, people may have forgotten. Records may have been lost. So um, it's an interesting story that he's both on the sun and tap, but he's actually here in Transcona. Um, and just uh, quickly to finish here, um, following his death, um, his wife and children actually ended up moving to British Columbia. So as far as we know, we don't have any anybody we can contact in the Transcona community that could confirm any of our any of our thoughts as to you know as to <laughs> the, the reasoning behind why he's here yeah. and on the cenotaph um is peter dixon buried in the cemetery now peter dixon was the one that owned the property that the cemetery is on um as far as i know he is not um and then there was also i think it was the karsten family who actually owned the property after him, they are not buried in the cemetery either. There, um, but that's one that we can definitely go back and double check on uh, to see if he is actually buried. There was actually a lot of Transconians who were buried in an Elmwood cemetery mm -hmm. as well. So we're going to move on to section five uh, and this is William Bill uh, Briar Cliff. Uh, born 1929 and died in 2007. Now he purchased the uh, Cook Funeral Home in 1963 and then built the new Transcona Funeral Chapel on Day Street. He was actually very active in preservation work on the 2747. When I first started at the museum, I actually attended a, a meeting of the local uh, Winnipeg Transcona Rotary Club and he came and spoke about his efforts to preserve the 2747. Um, and then he passed away just a couple of months after I had uh, seen his presentation. He's remembered as a strong supporter of the Transcona community and, his her uh, and its heritage. He also used to ride a motorcycle uh, in a uniform during the High Neighbor Festival uh, parades. He would ride this really cool uh, motorcycle. Um, now, since he he has a very unique and large uh, grave marker, and um, we just us we think it's just because he was um, you know he he had a lot of time to plan and had access to um, grave markers and things like that because he did work in the industry. So his is a very distinct uh, gravestone. It's you it's essentially almost the size of a couch and you could go and it, it's designed as like a chair that's a seat right there so you could like sit and reminisce and remember uh, if you went to visit him so section six um and this is perhaps one of my i suppose favorite um of the markers and just catherine Kloss herself is such a mystery um, so we're not, I, I can't quite tell when she's born and I can't quite confirm when she died. Um, and hers is the only example of a wooden cross in the cemetery. And it's a bit of a mystery. Her name, death, internment, age, and grave records are completely inconsistent. So her name is Catherine Kloss, but it's also been spelled uh, Kloss with an A, not an O. Um, her death is stated as being July 22nd, 1937, but other records indicate it may have been July of 1930 or 1931. And July 29th, not the 22nd. Yes. Um, her interment is stated as being August 1st, 1930. She was 55 years old, but other records indicate she was 17 or 18 years old, meaning she would have been born in 1919. And it's a two... 
It's a left right grave. So she's buried on the left side, but to the right, there is a Mary uh, Cobina, uh, K-O-C-I-N-B-A or K-O-C-I-U-B-A. Thank you. <laughs> um, she is buried on the right side and Mary was 48 years old at the time of her death in July of 1937. So just due to the passage of time, maybe the way in which I, I'm suspecting maybe someone's handwriting was not the greatest. So that's maybe why there is a confusion as to the dates. Um, and maybe she was confused with another individual, another Kloss, Catherine Kloss, who knows? Um, so this one is a very, it's a mystery, but it's very, it's very interesting. We're able to look up um, individuals through the city of Winnipeg's uh, Transcona Cemetery listing um, to get some of the information, but then when we've tried to cross-reference it at times, things haven't matched up. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, Mel Melvin uh, J.G. McMullen. Uh, he's buried in section six. Now, Mel McMullen was also known as Len Ventus, who was a magician, and he actually performed with his ventriloquist doll, Jerry, and there's the bottom photo is uh, there and them. We have Jerry at the museum. Uh, he came to Transcona in 1931, and he worked for North American Lumber. Uh, he was an elected school trustee and town council member, and he was actually the co-founder of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. He held membership number one, um, and notable other magicians uh, within that International Brotherhood of Magicians is, oh, and the name is escaping me right now, uh, Copperfield. I believe he is one. And the uh, International Brotherhood of Magicians really wanted to get Harry Houdini to join and he would not, he refused to join <laughs> their um, organization. organization. And the organization actually started um, downtown in, uh, I believe it was the Royal Bank building. It's now uh, the building just right across the street from City Hall, that's the Red River College uh, restaurants at the restaurant and then the dormitory is up there. And there used to be a plaque on the building. Um, and I got a tour of that building after Red River had moved in. And at some point in history, the plaque disappeared off the building and it's no longer there. But that's where the original offices were for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. He was also known as Mr. Manitoba due to his unfailing enthusiasm for the province, its heritage and resources. And he married um, Helen Cargill, who was uh, from Transcona uh, originally, like, so he moved here, but uh, she was an original uh, Transconian. Uh, so this is um, Albert Edward Golding, uh, section six. Uh, he was born in 1915 and died in 1978. He moved to Transcona in the 30s and worked at the Transcona shops. Uh, he was president of the East End Community Club for 20 years and has been credited for the founding of the club. He was praised for his leadership, spirit, and determination, and is now commemorated by the Ed Golden Memorial Arena. This next one, uh, Monroe H. McKenzie, uh, born 1907, died 1909. Uh, and this is an example of a reinternment following the opening of the cemetery. So uh, this individual was reinterred um, and that was held on May 18th, 1915. So 5.5 years after uh, he had passed. So this marker here um, is for Mike uh, Uremko, section seven. Uh, he was born in 1918 and died in 1927. And it's the only example of a metal cross in the cemetery. And there was once an image um, on the marker, but it has since faded away. Um, and their Uremko family, they were Austrian Ukrainian and they had immigrated to Canada in 1914. So like, I believe it's this one and the wooden cross are yeah. two that essentially they look handmade. 
like they're they're not the traditional gravestone that you see throughout the the cemetery but the they're, they're pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And the only two? Uh, this is Wallace Douglas, also known as Wally Douglas. He was born in 1915 and died in 1995. And he was one of the two surviving crew members of the Dougal train disaster, which uh, happened on September 1st, 1947. Uh, he was a rear train man aboard the Manaki Special. Um, and once after his passing a, a number of years later, his daughter or a relative of his actually brought uh, to the museum a retirement gift that he was given from CN. Um, and it's a, a model train and they had dubbed it Wally's train uh, because it was one that he had worked on. So we have a replica of that um, in our collection. Um, this is Alexander Taylor, Section 11. He was born in 1899 and passed away in 1961. He immigrated to Transcona from North Ireland in 1923, and he joined the Transcona police in 1923. He served as police and fire chief from 1945 to 1953, as well as served as justice of the peace until his death. And he is remembered for his kindness and devotion to the community. Now, the Taylor family is related to the Simpson family? Which is also yes. related to the Blakey family. Um, so there, uh, there's a connection there. So this is Bill Blakey's grandfather. Correct. Yes. Uh, this is Murdoch McKay. Uh, he was born in 1884 and he died in 1963. Um, he was a physician here in Transcona and then later became an MLA. Uh, he settled in Transcona in 1919 and began, began a medical practice. He retired in 1953. And I believe that one of the first deliveries, baby deliveries that he did here in Transcona was of Paul Martin. And... Um, because Paul Martin talks about it in a, in a video that we have about it, uh, because he went to uh, Murdoch McKay to get medical approval to enlist in World War II. He was an active member of the community, uh, and he's commemorated by uh, Murdoch McKay Collegiate here in Transcona. And he met his wife, Ruby, uh, during World War I, I believe, um, in Saskatchewan. She was originally from Saskatchewan. Just random, random things <laughs> that I'm recalling as we're as we're doing this. Uh, and we just had a uh, chat come up. Uh, Peter K. Dixon, so the individual who owned, uh, initially owned the land where the Transcona Cemetery is, is actually buried in the M. M. Wolf. M. Wolf. <laughs> Elmwood. <laughs> Elmwood Cemetery, and he died in October 1939. So he's not actually buried in the Transcona Cemetery. Uh, so this next one is Andrew Russell Pauley, and his marker is found in the Memorial Garden. Uh, he was born in 1909 and passed away in 1984. He moved to Transcona in 1938 and worked as the, at the shops as an upholsterer before entering politics as uh, the mayor of Transcona. He, would, he was also elected to the legislature in 1953 and would serve for uh, 25 years. And uh, Andrew Polly and Murdoch McKay were both actually nominees for the Greatest Transconian Contest that the museum did a number of years ago, and they were both top 10, uh, part of the top 10. So now we're going to move on to, um, we're still going to move our way into the newest sections of the cemetery, which are sections 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And the grave markers in the newer sections, um, the style and personal, personalization of the grave markers are very unique. Um, style, size, color, design, epitaphs, and adornments such as vases, photos, and scene etchings are very common in these sections. Yeah, it, it seems like there has been a shift from this is the three designs that you can choose from to you can design your own you know, there, there's a big say in, in what you can do for your um, grave, grave markers. This one in the upper left um, looks like a gas pump. 
And um, on the back of it, it says Husky. I think so. I think it's or a, Esso. It, it, it's one of the big brand names of uh, gas stations. Um, this one, it's, it's larger in size, uh, but it has this wonderful etching of, of the couple on it. Um, and over the years, like archaeologists have also studied this, like how um, grave markers have changed over time. And the view of a cherub uh, with wings actually evolved from initially gravestones had skulls with wings on them. And over time, as things evolved, that actually evolved into the image of the cherub with wings. So seeing how gravestones change and evolve and they grow and just the personalization of it is something really quite amazing. Um, and I, I like going and see the older gravestones, but some of the newer ones are just, they're, they're really special mm -hmm. too. Uh, so this is Paul Martin. We've mentioned him um, already. So he was born in 1920 and he died in 1916. 2016. 2016. <sighs> He, I'm just looking at the last two numbers. Uh, he was a veteran of the Second World War. He also served Transcona as a school trustee, a town councillor, city councillor, and he was actually mayor of Transcona at a time. He was named the greatest Transconian in 2005. He's the founder of the Transcona Museum. And in 2014 or early 2015, he was actually knighted by the French government. So he was Sir Paul Martin, uh, just due to his uh, efforts during World War II uh, and in France. Um, so this one here is, uh, we're gonna focus on Harry Fuller and it's located in section 17, but um, Fuller is a part of the Ferguson Fuller Harding family and it's a grouping of these markers here. Um, Harry Fuller himself was born in 1904 and died in 1976. He was the last mayor of the city of Transcona before the amalgamation with Winnipeg in 1972. He served 20 years on Transcona Council. He also worked as a machinist at the Transcona shops. And as I mentioned, as a part of this larger Fuller, Ferguson, Harding family. Uh, this is Christopher Stephen Quelch. He's in section 18. He was born in 1898 and died in 1986. Uh, he was an educator. He was a, a teacher here in Transcona. He was also a principal here in Transcona, but he was also a lepidopterist. And he started collecting butterflies and moss in 1943 and would become known as a local expert. He also collected bird eggs when he was a child too. His wife uh, Kathleen Violet Marshall is also credited with coll collecting specimens and we actually house um, over 8,000 um, items from his Lepidopteria collection um, here at the museum. So uh, he had actually moved to Toronto uh, around early 1980s and after his death, part of his collection was actually sold to another collector, a Mr. King. And when Mr. King died, part of his collection was donated to us, the Transcona Museum. And I believe some else of his collection went to the University of Manitoba. And apparently some also went to the Manitoba Museum. So his collection was, was very um, vast and large. But um, I had heard stories, uh, I had a gentleman come into the museum and, and we had some of the butterflies and moss on display. And he said, when he was in school, if he ever got in trouble and got sent to the principal's office, uh, all he had to do was start talking about butterflies or moths and he could distract uh, Mr. Quelch and maybe not get in as much <laughs> trouble as he, as he would have. Now, Quelch also served on the early museum board, didn't he? Yes, he was one of the original board members of the Transcona Museum when it was getting started. Uh, so this is Joseph Lofstein, Section 18. He was born in 1895, died 1981. He moved to Transcona in 1914 from Leningrad, Russia. Uh, he was a master tailor and he opened the first handmade to measure clothing store in Transcona. Um, he is best known for um, Blostein's department store, which he owned and operated uh, from the 1930s and uh, 
until the 1990s. Um, his son, oh, sorry, his name was synonymous with quality craftsmanship, superior service, and unparalleled selection. Yes, because like the unofficial model motto of Blostein's was something like, if I don't have it, you don't need it. Uh, if you can't find it at Blostein's, you don't need it. Don't go anywhere else, go to Blostein's. Um, he was, um, he owned a, no, he operated uh, the soup club. Um, yes. So employees from the Transcona shops at the end of their pay, pay period, they could put a little bit of money into the soup club and after a, a certain period of time and they had accumulated um, X amount of money, they could then get a handmade to measure suit from Blossom himself. Mm -hmm. When their name got to the top of the list, they had essentially set aside enough funds to do that. Uh, Joe Blostein was also one of the top 10 uh, nominees uh, for the greatest Transconian. Uh, this here is uh, a number of individuals. So the Blakey family, so this is section 18. Um, Robert, Sean and Dylan E both died of SIDS, uh, which is as a parent horrible, <laughs> like the one of the things we fear most. Um, Robert James was actually killed in a motorcycle accident um, at Grand Marais in 1979. Uh, Robert Nesbitt uh, came to Transcona in 1943 and worked for CN for 44 years. He served in World War II with the Canadian Naval Air Group. Uh, Kathleen Kay uh, worked as a teller at the Toronto Dominion Bank as a young woman, and she was an active and leading member uh, in various groups and organizations, and she married Robert in 1948. Um, so Robert Blakey, Kathleen Blakey, and then their, their sons, Robert, Robert, and Dylan. Um, no, that would be, so Robert and Kay were married. Yes. And then that is their son, James. Robert. But those are also their sons. No, those are grandchildren. Oh, yes, <laughs> apologies. So many, so many names. So this is, um, I'm sure, I think it's Lance, uh, no, Lieutenant Sergeant or Lance Sergeant, Lance Sergeant, uh, James Jim Tom, uh, Section 22. He was born in 1919 and died in 1995. He grew up in Transcona and attended Central School. He enlisted in the Second World War with the Winnipeg Grenadiers and was taken as a prisoner of war following the Battle of Hong Kong. And he was a prisoner of war from 1941 to 1945. He would survive the war and he returned to Transcona and his family. Mm -hmm. And um, we have some, not the originals, but we have some copies of letters uh, between him and his family during the time he was a prisoner of war. And I believe Paul Martin spoke about it in his book, In Awe of Life, just how uh, different he looked when he came back. Um, he was apparently a very tall man and had come back week um, after his time in the, in the prisoner of war camp. Uh, the next is uh, Teresa Ducharme. She's in the Gardens of Remembrance. She was born in 1945 and died in 2004. Uh, she was a Canadian disabilities rights activist. Uh, she required the use of a wheelchair after suffering polo, um, polio uh, and a respirator following a coma. So despite many health challenges, she became a strong advocate and a resourceful member of her community. She also ran for the Transcona Springfield School Board and for the Transcona Ward on Winnipeg City Council in the 1980s and 1990s. And she was also nominated, she was part of the group of individuals that were nominated for the Greatest Transconian as well. Um, so looking ahead into the future, um, there's been a lot of talk about um, improving the cemetery. And in 2018, the city of Winnipeg came up with the Transcona Cemetery Improvement Strategy. And the improvement strategy addresses land drainage issues in the early internment sections, renovation of the chapel or mortuary and to return it to active use, and plans for future uh, cemetery expansion. Um, 
And in terms of the expansion, um, you know, they're talking about relocating um, the cemetery, uh, sorry, the chapel into a new section, um, additional parking, uh, a mausoleum and family estates, um, a serene lake with potential for uh, water cremation interment, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, contemplative pathway, they're expanding the field of honor, additional trees, a new roadway, a cremation garden. So um, a lot of uh, great things um, to come to the cemetery in future years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of, another one of our board members, uh, Peter Martin, has been working with the cemetery. Uh, there's going to be uh, over a, one of the little ditches, like a little bridge built. And Peter, uh, last year for the no, he started the No Stone Left Alone um, project here uh, at the Transcona Cemetery, where at the beginning of Remembrance Week, school children come out um, to for you know remembrance of the the veterans who died after returning, uh, you know, coming home from serving in the World Wars. But Peter is also um, he had created this past year a board that also listed all the individuals who died during World War I and World War II, there are the killed in actions from Transcona, and for them to be commemorated at the Transcona Cemetery as well. They're, at, they're on the Cenotaph, but he had created a board so that they could be remembered there as well. And so these new bridges that are gonna be going over the ditch, um, he's working to get some plaques made up on there so that those names can be uh, commemorated and remembered at the Transcona Cemetery as well permanently. If you just go back, um, so there's this new section. Whoops, I should use the mouse. So here's the new section, and um, so the bridges are going to be over here um, somewhere. Yes. And yes. So now we have come to our live question and answer period. Um, so please feel free to use the chat function or the comment section if you're watching on Facebook Live. And now there's a bit of a delay when we do face, uh, on Facebook. So, um, so if you have a question or comment, leave it uh, in the chat. Uh, and we just had a comment that came in a little while ago, but uh, Peter K. Dixon, he is actually buried in the, uh, oh, we said that, yeah. Elmwood Cemetery. <laughs> uh, he died in October 1939. And if you think of a question after the fact, um, you know, we, we will address those comments, uh, those questions and comments later. So we're, we're always going back and seeing if any new comments have been added. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting. I, I personally, I find cemeteries a place, like they're peaceful places to go and to, to walk around and just to see how people are remembered. Uh, the last time when we went in, we were taking photographs for this presentation. We saw numerous people that were, um, uh, you know, cleaning up gravestones of family members, spending time with them, you know, things like that. Did we have a Facebook comment? We did. Um, so why is the cemetery located just outside of Transcona? Um, and it's fantastic question. <laughs> fantastic question. It's essentially when the town of Transcona was looking for land to purchase, that was the, there was numerous parcels of land that were um, sort of brought forward as potentials. And that was the one that was selected. It just so happens it's actually outside the boundary of the town of Transcona and it's within Springfield. Um, no indication as to, um, uh, and perhaps maybe they suspected that the town would grow up a little bit differently and maybe a, a you know, South Transcona was going to develop differently. So, you know, the cemetery wouldn't have been as far as removed as it feels now. Right, because um, South Transcona had actually been planned, like, um, been planned for not land divisions, um, like subdivisions. It was subdivisions. Be a huge subdivision. And that went right up to the cemetery. Um, so, they would they had they were planning for significant growth of South Transcona, um, which unfortunately that those subdivisions never never happened. Any other questions? That last question came to us um, via Facebook Live. Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. Again. 
If you are watching this after, uh, you can always leave your question in the comment box and we'll do our best to get back to you. You can always email us your questions and we'll do our best to get back to you as well. And if you think of other individuals that we should be including in this small talk, because we will most likely be um, adding to this it again, yeah, adding to it and, and doing this presentation again. So please uh, feel free to send us more. There were a couple other individuals on our first few passes through the cemetery that were like, yes, this is great. And then when we went back to take photos, one of them, I think the grave marker had actually been removed yes. to add another individual on it. And we didn't get a picture the first time and a couple others uh, we just weren't able to find again. Uh, find again, or, you know, there's just not a lot of information for the really early ones mm -hmm. to be able to fully tell their story. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of the earlier ones as well mm -hmm. and fill out that history. So uh, just some of our other upcoming small talks that we have. So next Tuesday, it's Snapshot, a look through 1960s Transcona, where we'll be highlighting um, negatives that we have from the actual Transcona newspaper. They came to us a roundabout way, but that's what they're from. So we, it's a really, really cool collection. Um, I've been going through and I've been, um, I asked on uh, Instagram for people to give us ideas of what they want to see, different themes, so events, animals, places, people, businesses, anything, and we'll try to find, see if there's representation of it in the collection and then put it in. And then the Tuesday after that, our final one of our summer session, our final small talk, is what's missing from the TM collections. So we have over 50,000 artifacts in our collection. However, there are significant holes and gaps in Transponus history um, that we don't have here at the museum. So what are those? What are we looking for? But with the catch 22 that we don't have much room. <laughs> so, but there are significant things that uh, we don't have. And so we'll be talking about those uh, in that last small talk for our summer session. Oh, and before you move on, um, you can RSVP for these events on our website um, for the Zoom link and password. Um, if you're attending on Facebook, that's just tuning into our page live. You can also uh, attend in person. Um, just before this uh, talk uh, began, I noticed that some individuals were posting links to the talk in our comment section. Those are not um, links that are associated with us. They're potential scams. Oh. Um, so please, if you're going to join our talk, it's only through the Transcona Museum's website or our Facebook page on our events section. Yes. Yes. Please do not respond to anything in the comments, <laughs> any links in comments. Wow. Have we made it? Potentially. Yeah. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and just ask that you support the museum. Um, you can consider making a donation or becoming a museum member. Um, stay in touch, visit our website, find out what's going on, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and we have a blog. Join our mailing list and find out what's going on month to month uh, with the museum. And thank you, and we'll hope you'll join us again next week. Bye! Bye.